Welcome to the Determined People Podcast. We are committed to spreading encouragement, strength, and hope to a world in desperate need of it. Everywhere you look in today's culture, you see stories of remarkable people experiencing remarkable success. Our show focuses on the backstories of everyday, relatable people who have achieved greatness in their lives. We focus on the story behind what we see in the world. Our hope is that you find yourself in these stories, that you say, if that person made it, so can I. And now, our host, John Harrell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. We're back with another episode of the Determined People podcast. Today, we are going to interview author Kim Gatlin, who wrote a book in 2006 called Good Christian Bitches. I love the title. I wish I'd thought of it to write a book about it because it's it's so rich and it says so much. So we're going to hear about how she wrote the book, how she came up with the idea, and also about it got turned into a TV series in 2012. We're going to hear about that. So let's get started. Welcome. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. So the title of the book, Good Christian Bitches. What is a good Christian bitch? A good Christian bitch is somebody who's really trying hard and failing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The queens of it are the ones who aren't really trying that hard. They're just pretending to Mm -hmm. and not failing because they're meaning to do the things they do. A little subversive there maybe, a little behind the scenes motives and all. I'm just thinking of as like a good Christian bitch would be the one who would use religion as a tool to be judgmental and Mm -hmm. I'm better than you, holier than thou, that kind of attitude. Is that Hidden. Absolutely. Okay. Well, and, and the best way to spread gossip without gossiping is asking for somebody to pray for your friend who's going through blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> and you don't even, you've described it so well by the time you're finished that you don't need to give them a name because they know who you're talking about. Yeah, the anonymity's <laughs> gone away, right? Just put, put her up here on the blocks. Hang her, bro. They have four kids and they're married to a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> she just moved back Drive to California. Drive a green car. You know, yeah. Just, yeah. No. So where did the idea for the book come from? I love the title, by the way. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, what's really funny is... I was having, you know, my ex and I were so civil and we did collaborative law. I didn't want people thinking poorly of my children's father. He didn't want people thinking poorly of their mother. So there was no blood on the sidewalk. We weren't talking ugly about each other. We weren't airing our dirty laundry. And, um, but it made it worse. It's like, because there was no information to be had, people just made it up. And it was so funny because one of the nastiest were these women who were big Bible study people. And, um, I was talking to a girlfriend of mine one day who was actually a flight attendant. She wasn't a big religious person at all, you know. And um, she goes, you know, i got to tell you, I'm really floored by the behavior of some of these good Christian women. And I go, you mean good Christian bitches? And we both (laughs) just died laughing. And I said, I think I'm going to write a book and call it Good Christian Bitches. And I didn't want to be one of those people who said they were going to write a book and never did. So um, I just, you know, I had the title and I wrote a book around it. (laughs) But it was easy to do because I was living it at the time. Yeah, as an author myself, I wish I thought of the title because it is so rich. It says <laughs> so much. Now, you grew up in Park Cities, mm-hmm. which it's set in the fictional city of Hillside, Hillside Park. Park. Uh-huh. Yeah. Park Highland Park, uh-huh. but, but I mean, very thinly discussed. So very thinly. You, but you knew what the repercussion, what the blowback was going to be having grown up in that city. You know what? Honestly, I didn't. No. Um, you know, the people who grew up in the neighborhood, we all, you know, we laugh about these girls who, mm-hmm. they didn't grow up in Highland Park. They grew up in, say, maybe East Dallas and or North Dallas, mm-hmm. okay? And they act like they were airdropped into Highland Park Village, okay, at 25. And they have no history prior to that because they never make any references to friends they grew up with or other family members they have that live in town in mm-hmm. Dallas. You know, it's like, the, you know, inside these fabled borders is all they know and all they've ever known, which you know isn't true because you know when they showed up, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the people who grew up there and lived there, I knew they were going to get it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the people who are trying to be more Holland Park than Holland Park, you know, decided to make it about them, you know, or they, you know, it was really funny because the idea is everybody could have been in on the joke, but a few people chose to insist on making themselves the brunt of the joke. And that's where the trouble came from. I think you refer to these people as renters versus owners mm-hmm. in the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is a great way to great way to to, to tag it. Yeah. So, how many people called you saying that they were uh, they were one of the fictional characters in the book? Because it is a work of fiction. But how many people called you and said you wrote about me? I mean, I'm not trying my, to about my that. biggest regret <clears throat> is I wish I would have consulted with whatever the leading psychiatric 
department is of whatever university it is mm-hmm. in the world. I don't care if it's in Geneva. I wish I would have gotten them first and brought them in tow on this journey with mm-hmm. me because it would have been the most interesting study in human behavior <laughs> ever. People who never crossed my mind were convinced that and that they were certain people people that it should have been so obvious, you know, because I mean, I, it, to them, I didn't make it obvious to anybody else. Cause I mean, I wasn't any better than them if I handed somebody their head on a platter with sure, this, sure. but, um, <clears throat> you know, it just went right by them. They had no idea I was talking about them, you know, <laughs> but they're not very good at being very, you know, they think reflections better left to mirrors. you know. So <laughs> I didn't, I shouldn't have expected them to get it. Uh, and then people that I'd never even heard of, never met in my life. Um, I had two different videos that girlfriends sent me from two different hair salons, two girlfriends who did not know each other. Mm -hmm. And they both sent me um, videos that they snuck with their phone of these women holding court in this hair salon talking about how they were the inspiration for one of the characters. Really? And I'd never seen this person before in my life. (laughs) I mean, it was bizarre. It really was. It was kind of hard to disprove if you don't even know who the person is. No no idea. I was like, uh, (laughs) it was was crazy. What's it it like to lose, you know, Friends, we I put in quotation marks. We have acquaintances, we have our entire inner circle. So I'm thinking anybody that's in your inner circle, you didn't really lose. Mm. But I think your mom lost a good friend, didn't she? Yeah, uh, yeah. A woman who'd been her best friend for like 40 years, and uh, it was so sad because I even told this woman. I mean, like, just you know, whether I meant to hurt her feelings or not, the fact is her feelings were hurt. Okay, <laughs> so I took her flowers. I wrote her a lovely note. You know, I, I, I didn't, you know dictate it to the florist over the phone. I mean, I, I went and picked up the flowers myself, but then attached the note, took it to her house. And I was just like, you know, I'm so sorry that somebody convinced you. And it's the person who convinced her of this had an agenda. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole nother story that, mm-hmm. that the person who had convinced her that she was that character, um, had an agenda and, and I've, I've got to commend her on a plan well executed because it worked. I mean, she believed that was about her and it ruined a 40 year friendship with my mother. Wow. And, um, you know, which most people would say, well, I guess she wasn't your friend in the first place, but they really were, you know, and the, the sad thing was, is my, my stepfather and this woman's husband mm-hmm. had the same birthday and, you know, they always okay. celebrated together every year for 40 years and all that. And, um, but you know, mom was really cool about it. She was like, you know what? She was like, you explained yourself, you know, I explained and, you know, that's the truth and we know it. And all I can think of is, you know, what if you had murdered somebody and I was going to visit you in prison and she disapproved of my you know, visits, you know, I mean, that's not a supportive friend. No. What so, a healthy attitude your mom has. I, I was so proud of her because really and truly, I go, hey, mom, I said, we can have our own little thing on the side. Nobody needs, needs to know you're talking to me because you know, <laughs> mom was an only child, you know, so her friends were her whole life, you know, and it just broke my heart for her, you know, but, um, you know, I was like, look, and she was like, are you kidding me? I'm not about to do that. So. <laughs> good for her. Yeah. You know, today in 2022, it, it would be no problem with saying good Christian bitches. But did you have any trepidation telling any family members about the title yes. of your book? Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> my real father um, told me one day, he said, your grandmother knows you've written a book, but um, she didn't, doesn't know anything else about it. And he said, you need to talk to her about it. And I said, yeah, I was kind of hoping that you'd do that for me, Dad. And he said, no. Mm-mm. This is your battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my grandmother was, at the time, she was 88. She was still teaching Sunday school. Um, she was, we had a funeral service in the same church that she was baptized in, in Cushing, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. You know, she was just as Baptist as they come. So I was apprehensive, to say the least, about talking to her about it because I wasn't sure. She was cool, but I didn't know she was going to be cool enough to get it, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so I took her to lunch one day, and I said, okay, so I've written this book. And I said, it's about the evils of gossip. And I, I said, and the title of it is Good Christian Bitches. And she burst out laughing. She goes, well, we've all known a few of those, haven't we? And that was the end of the conversation. And I thought, you know what? I've watched her walk. You know, I mean, I've spent my whole life, you know, just she always talked about how she was a student. You know, she was always a student, you know, that, that you know, she didn't have all the answers. But if we ever asked her a question and she couldn't answer it, she'd always be like, well, let me research it and I'll get back to you. You know, she was never one of those, you know, I'm such a good Christian and I know it all, that kind of thing. And um, just the minute I had her seal of approval, you know, it, it didn't really matter to me what anybody else thought. There you go. Yeah. It's like your grandmother had a lot of wisdom. Lots. Yeah. She was a cool chick. Yeah. She really was. <laughs> <laughs> you miss her, I bet. I do. A ton. Yeah. She had these great little one-liners. Like, she used to say all the time, if the people who love us didn't love us when we were bad, nobody would ever love us. And, you know, just little things like that. You know, you'd be... Something that would take me five hours and, you know, a million words to try and comfort mm-hmm. somebody. She had one-liners for them. <laughs> so. I may steal that one. Yeah, you ought to. <laughs> That's a good one. It is so good has, one. All the, has all the gossip and stuff, and the thing was published in 2006, it's 16 years old. Has all that died down now? 
for the most part. I mean, there's so, you know, and and here's the thing: it just tells you that they're they're not really hanging on to that; they're hanging on to something else, you know. And and I think um, for a lot of people, um, like I said, it was just a handful that you know objected. And I'll never forget, there's one lady, it was a friend of that group of women, that everybody, you know, behind her back, they used to make fun of her and talk about how she practiced witchcraft Mm -hmm. because she got into charts and, you know, their uh, sun signs and all that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff. And, you know, as far as I knew, this woman never darkened the door of a church, right? And she was the one who was most offended by my book title. (laughs) It's like, blow it out your (laughs) you-know-what. You know, people's reactions or responses, and those are two different different meanings uh, of those words, but... That tells you a lot about them. Exactly. That's how, that's just how I looked at it, you know? You know, one thing about your book is, now as I was thinking about this, preparing for today, was your good Christian bitches really is advancing God's kingdom because it causes us, it forces us, those who are willing, to take a look at our own hearts. That was the main thing. I had to look at my own heart and see how many people I'd sent running away from, from religion like their hair was on fire. You know, mm-hmm. looking at me going... You know, wow, if that Kim Gatlin, you know, is a Christian, I don't want any, anything to do with that, you know. And that's, you know, something else that some people miss. I wouldn't take anybody's in inventory. I was just saying, you know, we all need to look at where we could do better, mm-hmm. you know, and we all can, yeah. you know. And go back to the words of Jesus. Why do you, and i got to paraphrase it, but but why do you, why are you worried about the splinter in your friend's Plank, eye when you yeah. have a beam in your own, right? <laughs> yeah. and like, I've kind got of, a redwood forest. Yeah, <laughs> mic drop, Jesus, right? <laughs> You know, I was, love his mic drops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a lot of. Them. I just, and I don't follow any particular religion. I just follow Jesus, and that's good enough for me. And Absolutely. try to live up to that standard and fail. But you know, that's you, you, no matter what you think, if you believe who he is, who he said he was, or not, you can't find fault with anything he ever did. Well, you know, it's what, what, another interesting thing about this is I've found that that some of the people who were the most vocal about their disapproval of this weren't believers. But yeah, and then you're like, boy, you you might believe more than I do, you know, <laughs> considering you know this fictitious character that you've got up there with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Dew Fairy, you know. But you, for you to get this rabid about it, you yeah. know, there's obviously some belief in there somewhere. There's something you know? there, yeah. You hit a nerve. And by the way, Santa Claus is real. I, I, so I refuse to ever stop believing in Santa because if you do, a little part of you dies, and I'm not ready to die. I used to tell my kids all the time that as long as you believe, he's going to keep coming. That's, right. that's, that is, that's exactly right. I tell my kids the same thing. Let's switch gears a little bit. It became a TV series. It did. How did that happen? That I mean, these things don't just happen, but it happened. I, honestly, I, I know you'll get this because you and I have talked about this subject enough. It, 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 was, it was a God thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, God was in charge, and it was just every door that needed to open in order for it to advance to the next place— um, it just did. Those are hard doors to open. Tell me how it got the momentum really, because it, it happened pretty fast. Real fast. Um, first of all, the press was really good to me because um, I was kind of the gatekeeper for my ex-husband, Rudy Gatlin, and for my cousin, Angie Horman. Mm-hmm. And whenever any press people would reach out to me, you know, I was always polite and I always said, look, all I can do is pass the message on, you know. Mm-hmm. And they knew that I felt like, you know, I was making a decision for them mm-hmm. if I didn't pass the message on, you know. Um, so it paid off in spades when this, they reached out to me when they heard about the book and wanted to interview, interview me, which was very kind. And then, um, one of the people who interviewed me also wrote, they wrote for a local publication, but they also wrote for Newsweek Mm -hmm. and they put, um, a Q and A in Periscope and Newsweek. And it happened to be that commemorative issue, that Obama issue. Mm -hmm. And it was the week before the election and we were about to have our first black president. And Mm -hmm. so it was, it was kind of, you know, like your commemorative issue for lack of a better term. I think a lot of people picked that up that might not have otherwise. And my phone blew up. I mean, I had everybody from the two and a half men people Mm -hmm. to, um, the ugly Betty in the office people, you know, reaching out to me, you know, wanting to do a TV show. And I had no idea what I was, I didn't know what I was doing when I wrote a book. I really didn't know anything about TV at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, thank God I had a very dear girlfriend who had worked for, uh, she was Patrick Swayze's personal assistant for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, she put me in touch with an entertainment attorney who, um, got me my agent, William Morris. And I mean, it happened super fast. So, yeah. So walk me through the process of going to Hollywood, meeting with TV executives. You know, every single time, so I can tell you this because, I, I mean, the way your show's based, um, I would literally put my hand on the door do- doorknob before I'd walk in there. I'd go, okay, God, they can't eat me and I might learn something. So you're in charge, you know, mm-hmm. and, and 
And Darren even asked me, Darren Starr, after he optioned my show, mm -hmm. he said, you know, you never acted like you were intimidated. You never acted like, you know, you were overwhelmed or bothered by any of this, you mm -hmm. know. And we just thought that was interesting because most people, you know, I was like, y you get where I grew up, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> and, you know, I just looked at it like whatever's supposed to happen is going to happen, sure. you know. And that's how I still feel about it today. I mean, there's been several failed attempts at bringing it back to do other things. And we've got, you know, stuff going on right now that I can't talk about yet, of course, you know, but, um, you know, it's not like I'm making it up because I always send out press releases. You know? <laughs> so I'm not in charge at deadline. <laughs> so, so before we get into the actual series, um, obviously they didn't eat you because right. you're still here. And, and I learned a lot. Yeah. And, and they didn't even take a bite out of you. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things you learned? You know, it's really funny. It, it's, um, they're, most of them are business people. You know, most of them aren't looking to, you know, screw you over like everybody hears, you know. Um, most of them aren't. You, one thing I noticed where you can tell the true professionals, they're not looking to take credit for your work. You know, there's a bunch, of, especially in Dallas. I, I don't know where they all came from, but it's like we don't even have much of an entertainment industry here in Dallas. There's a lot of people out there posing as entertainment people. Mm -hmm. And all they're trying to do is attach themselves to your project so they can take credit for it. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life. I hope it's going to be short-lived. Um, it's been going on for a long time. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But I just recently ran into some stuff that I was like, this is bizarre. Um, but everybody out there just couldn't have been nicer. They're big on manners. And they're big on one thing that you can really help yourself if you understand most people going into those situations have one baby in the nursery, mm -hmm. whereas the people you're approaching to collaborate with have 50. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, do you have to stay in front of them and you have to remind them that you're there and that, you know, you need their time and attention, but you can't act like your project's the only one they've got going <laughs> because there's 9,000 people standing behind you that sure. they're, they're dying to talk to them too. Sure. You know? I think when you walked into your agent's office at William Morris, there were 300 scripts on, on their table, right? Yeah. I think... I think effort <clears throat> means a lot to them because, you know, especially in today's day and age, you know, you've got all sorts of social media influencers and stuff that get, you know, famous overnight <laughs> and type thing. Yeah. Um, I think she appreciated that I'd kind of put my money where my mouth was and my heart was, mm -hmm. that I'd, I'd gone the extra mile and self-published the book and I brought her a finished prod, prod, product instead of, you know, 300 pages of a manuscript because she had, I mean, floor to ceiling. They, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I walked in there with my book, and um, it was 4 o'clock on a Friday. It was when my meeting was with mm -hmm. her. And she said, I'm going to read this over the weekend, and I'll call you Monday and let me let you know if I want to represent you. And she called me Monday morning. It's like, I love it. Let's do this, you know. But I really do think the reason she read my book over the weekend rather than one of those other 900 scripts that were sitting on her desk was because it was a real book and she saw that I was very committed to my own project. Mm -hmm. Some people act like they're only half committed to a project and they want somebody to really get behind it and move them forward. Yeah. They're not looking to do that is what I discovered. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It shows a willingness to do the work. Exactly. You've already done the work mm -hmm. and now here's my product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. It's a great read too. So over Thank a weekend, you. I mean, I read the book and I, I had a hard time putting it down. Oh, I love that. Because it is a page turner, and the story is fascinating, and I know enough about Highland Park to, to picture everything. But I was like, I've got other stuff i got to go do here. I've got, right, yeah. I've got a phone call I've got to make. I'll be, I'll be right back to you. But, you know, but it, was, it was that kind of book. I but love the, that. But then the TV series, mm -hmm. it was 10, ten episodes, mm -hmm. but they changed the name. Why they changed the name to GCB from Good Christian Bitches? Because it was network, and they couldn't. And back then, I, I think you can cuss on TV now, but back then you couldn't. Really? Yeah. That was 2012. It was only 10 years ago. I don't know. That nuts. It seemed like a lifetime but ago. But think about the things you hear on TV in the last few years that you've never heard on TV before. Sure. Yeah. Or seen. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But, I, I, okay, I take issue with one one thing there. Okay. Is, uh, well, I'll take issue with two. One is, and we talked about this off screen, but Hollywood loves to make us look and sound like Hicks, right? Yeah. And those axe hands are just way overblown. <laughs> We're not going to change that, okay? Right. But the other one is this. They won't put Good Christian Bitches, the title, which is, again, it says a lot. But in the opening scene of the TV pilot, Bill Vaughn, who is Amanda, the main character's soon-to-be-deceased husband, is driving down the Pacific Coast Highway with a boatload of cash trying to get to Tijuana to <laughs> escape the feds. And the girl that's in the car with him, who is not his wife, right. proceeds to put her head in his lap and give him oral sex. 
So they can do that, but they can't put do you the love word it? bitches on. Yes. Do you sketch the irony here? Absolutely. I yes. And, yes. And by the way, that scene wasn't in my book. No, it was not. It was not. I mean, and to our, to our audience, I want them to know you can read the book and and watch the 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 TV show. And get two complementary, similar, similar experiences, but both entertaining experiences because they're both great. Oh, thank you. I laughed my ass off at GCB, you know. And again, it sounds like a vitamin <laughs> store or something. It means GCB means nothing. So why do they cancel it? You know, um, there was a meeting last week actually mm-hmm. um, that confirmed something that would always heard. There was a lot of stuff going on at ABC at the time, mm-hmm. and. Um, there was some internal things going on in production at the time. It didn't have anything to do with the five million mad moms or whatever they call themselves. I can't even remember who took credit for it, of course, you know, <laughs> which it turned out there were like 5,000 of them. And, and anyway, but of course they jumped on it real quick and took credit for it. And they had absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, but just the timing of it just wasn't right. So, mm-hmm. And and I think with all the attempts to reboot it, that, you know, when it was going to go to the CW, mm-hmm. you know, was I thrilled? Absolutely. Was I grateful? Of course. You know, but I always knew that their audience was so young that there was too much material being left on the table. Because mm-hmm. those girls, when you're in high school, you had those life experiences that, you know, really put you to the test. Are you going to do the right thing? Are you going to be a good Christian bitch? You know, <laughs> so, um, but if my choices were, you know, do it that way or not at all, of course, I would opt for, you know, to do it that way. And um, now we have a, a much better opportunity to do it right, you sure. know. Sure. So I think all this was practice. I hope it does reboot. I, do. I really hope it does because it's great. And I've got to tell you, they, Hollywood didn't destroy the characters. Mm-mm. Not at all. They changed them a little bit. But I love the way they cast Amanda. I love her inner strength, and I love her story of redemption and restoration of her, who she truly is. That, mm-hmm. that comes through in, in that. Annie Potts, who plays her mom, was hilarious. She she couldn't have nailed her better. Nailed Annie's her character better. was way more like my mother. The in the book, I'd done everything I could to make her just the antithesis of my mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom has never had a cigarette in her life, and she can't break a hundred on the golf course. And mm-hmm. I made I made Annie's character in the book a scratch golfer and a chain smoker. <laughs> and um, when Darren met my mother, he mm-hmm. just he fell in love with my mom. Mm-hmm. And so Annie's character in the show is a dead ringer for my mother. <laughs> it's like God always talks to me through Christian Dior. <laughs> <laughs> so. That was awesome. That was awesome. So how much of you is in Amanda? You know, very little, actually. Amanda is a blend of three of my best girlfriends at the time. Mm-hmm. One, of, Two of them still are. One of them's not. Um, and I'd, I'd had a front row seat to what they went through in their divorces. Mm-hmm. And it was ugly and awful, you know, which was, you know, it, it, I wish people would realize that when somebody's going through something like that, they're hanging on by a thread as it is. Mm-hmm. The last thing they need is for some, you know, insensitive person to be having fun and games at their expense, sure. you know? Um, but I'd, I'd watched a lot of, of what they went through and how they handled themselves, mm-hmm. you know? And it's so funny because there's so much to be said. You know, there, somebody asked me the other day if I regretted not addressing some of the things at the time. And I'll never forget Alan Pepperd, who has since passed away, but mm-hmm. he was the... He was uh, a columnist for Dallas Morning News, yes. Absolutely. Alan was a very dear friend of mine, and he really held my hand through this whole thing. And... Um, I'll never forget him saying to me, you can't go around correcting the daily record. And I was like, you know, it was like those words just rung in my ears because I was like, you know what, you're right, Mm -hmm. you know. And, I mean, at the time I had two children I had to take care of. Mm -hmm. That It was my job to make sure that they didn't, you know, they say mom's the barometer in the home. Mm -hmm. And if your mom, if the mom is, you know, freaking out and, you know, a mess, you know, your kids can sense that. They sure. can feel that. And there's no safety in that for children. Mm-hmm. And I mean, here, you know, I just got a divorce. I needed to be the best I could be for my kids. And then I had these women who, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to have my own children while I was chasing wealthy men with airplanes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I've got nothing to but time on my hands. So here, let me do this for my entertainment, you know. Sure. And I just, I couldn't participate, you know. And if I had to do it all over again, would I, would I have gone back and probably put some of that to bed? I probably mm-hmm. would have. Um, You know, my grandmother used to say all the time that, you know, will this matter in five years? You know, and Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that at the time. And here we are, however many years later that we were talking about, you know, that damaged friendship my mother still has with, you know, 
her former best friend. So there are some things that I do wish I'd have, I, I would have I would have addressed in the moment instead of just letting them go. Sure. Yeah. You know, so you mentioned your how old were your kids when the book came out? Two thousand six. Oh Lord. Okay. So Lauren was born in ninety six. She was ten. Yeah. Oh no, no, she wasn't born in ninety. Yeah, she was. Um, and then Austin's Austin was born in ninety one. To make him fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. What was was their effect on them? Oh no, no, no. Their friends loved it. I mean, their friends. I mean, would, their friends, but like, would some of the parents maybe say, "Well, you can't go associate with." I don't know. Okay, because <laughs> parents can be kind of catty like that too. Well, the parents in that neighborhood, they loved it. Since I don't drink, right? Not, mm-hmm. So nine times out of ten, I would take them places like on the weekends and mm-hmm. stuff because I wasn't. It, it, anyway, they weren't going to pass up an opportunity to have a you know free babysitter. <laughs> And a sober driver. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, I got that. So creatives can be a little bit sensitive sometimes with mm-hmm. their work. And mm-hmm. they sometimes be hesitant to even put it out there, even yeah. though it's great work. Um, how did you feel about them changing some of the aspects of the book in, in, in the in the series? I feel like I was so lucky because, I mean, I adored Darren Starr and I had so much respect for everything he'd accomplished. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and I knew he'd sat at the feet of like Aaron Spelling, mm-hmm. you know. And I just... I couldn't imagine. I, I remember him telling me one day, he thought he was giving me some bad news, that um, he assumed I was going to ask for something. And um, I didn't and um, never intended to. And, and when he when he told me, look, before this even comes up, I just want you to know. And I said, you know, look, I'm just here to learn. I'm here to sit at your feet and mm-hmm. soak up everything I possibly can, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I really and truly, he and Aaron Kaplan both, I had b- blind faith in both of them. I mean, I would follow those men into a fire, okay? And I can count on one hand the number of men I've said that to in my lifetime, you know? And um, I just trusted them to do right by it, and I feel like they did, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and there were a couple people that um, that I, I, I didn't have that kind of confidence in that were attached to the project, mm-hmm. and that's that's actually where the trouble came from. Okay. So um, it, but it ended up that, you know, what happened with it was supposed to happen with it you know mm-hmm. that's how I had to look at it so. so you mentioned something earlier that I really want to, to hammer out for our audience and that is in in all industry but mm-hmm. in the entertainment industry everybody wants to be on the periphery right mm-hmm. I mean you go to Hollywood and meet people that have projects in 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 commotion or whatever and it's like but they're not really in the business they're just sort <laughs> of in the, the renters versus the buyers right but the real people the people you're talking about yeah. like a Darren Starr who I've never met but I know his reputation mm-hmm. They're serious and they're solid and they're great. What a great blessing so is the only word that it comes absolutely to mind was. to be able to connect with it him. It was totally a God thing, I'm telling you. Had to ha- well, it had mm-hmm. to be. Had yeah. to be. But the, because, you know, the other thing is that, that it hit Newsweek in 2008, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. But it took four years to get the series to TV. Things move at a rapid pace. But that's actually very slow. It is a lot of hurry up and wait. I mean, you got to have other stuff going on, or you will lose your mind, or drive your friends crazy. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's great. I mean, it's great work, the book and the and the, and the show. I hope they, I do hope they bring it back. Um, I was actually talking about it last night. I was in a restaurant, D. Leak and Prime. Up, up there, yeah. And I walked over. I was talking to a table of nine women. Right. Oh, I love it. And I'm telling them about uh, our interview today. I uh-huh. said you got to get the book, and you got you got to buy the the series off Amazon. And a couple of them said they bought the book. Now I don't know if I didn't go over and check their phone app, but they sure yeah. enjoyed. The stories of it as, as I was telling. It. So, anyway, um, what else do you have in the works nowadays? Oh my gosh! Okay, I just did a couple months ago. I did a show I never thought I'd do in a million years. It was it's called Alien Endgame, uh-huh. and it's on Discovery Plus. I saw it, and I'm a producer on that. And then um, right now we're working with a certain high profile um, police department. Mm-hmm. Um, working on doing a show with them that I can't talk about yet. Okay, and then there's also um, Notorious criminal who um, approached me about ghostwriting his book Mm -hmm. and um, we've already turned that into a docu-series and um, should that should be out before the end of the year awesome I know it's fun so you're a busy girl I'm a busy girl and if you write the counterpart with the males talking about like if you if if good Christian bitches if you do it one for men Mm -hmm. please change my name I will I promise (laughs) I will. Kim Gatlin, has been great. Thank you for coming on. I Thanks really appreciate it. The greatest gift you can give somebody is, is your time because you can't get it back. And thank you for sharing your time with me. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks. <laughs> that is our show for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us. And get the book. Good Christian Bitches is a great read. It's a quick read. And <laughs> go buy GCB off Amazon Prime. I think it's like $15 for the entire season. I've watched it twice, and I laugh 
my ass off <laughs> all the way all the way through it and they they cast it perfectly you'll see somebody that you know in that cast i'll be back tomorrow on the audio uh, podcast with another 20 to 30 second inspirational thought until then everyone be well